Howard, could you tell us why Merck undertook a procurement initiative in 2005? Well, the real reason why it, it undertook a procurement initiative is because the company was very much um, at a competitive disadvantage with other pharmaceutical companies in terms of doing so. A number of Merck's competitors had already taken moves in this, in this area. And it was also part of a, a cultural shift that was trying to be driven um, by the president of Merck Manufacturing, who later became the CEO of Merck, uh, Richard Clark. Uh, the initiative really was about, if you look at a company and you have what are flat to, to declining revenues and increasing costs, which is what Merck had for three years in a row, I mean, that's like the jaws of death. Um, and he saw a need to, to attack the, uh, the cost base of the company in a way that would um, bring credibility to shareholders and in a way that would also bring about a certain discipline and a new culture within Merck uh, because there was this culture of entitlement. Basically that um, if I had budget money, I could spend my budget money, I could do whatever you know, I wanted with it. And, and this was something where if there was ever going to be some sort of a, uh, a discipline and control of the cost line, they needed to do something. And, and like I said, their competitors were already doing it. There were lots of examples of successes of it in the pharmaceutical industry. And so it was recognized as, a, as an unmet, unmet need for the company. How was procurement organized at Merck before the 2005 initiative? Well, it was mostly um, you had a centralized group uh, within procurement, uh, but it was not addressing a lot of areas of spend within the company. And then you also had a decentralized plant procurement, site procurement type of network all throughout the world. There were some 33 sites around the world and some 150 people who did procurement at those various sites throughout the world who were not part of the procurement organization. They reported up through their site management organizations. So um, the people who were in the centralized organization though, uh, when it was all said and done, they were only touching a little over 50% of Merck's total spend. So a lot of the spend that was going on throughout the company was being done in a non-strategic way. It was being done in a very, it was first of all, it was being done by stakeholders and budget holders who um, basically were not schooled in best practices in terms of how you run and manage category of spend, how you manage a supply base effectively. And so there was a lot of opportunity that was being lost with virtually every transaction that was being made. And when you're talking about a spend base for a company of over $7 billion globally, that's a huge potential impact to the bottom line of a company and to earnings per share uh, for not doing that the right way. So um, that's how it was initially. And there was also, um, uh, in terms of the whole psychology of what it meant to be a procurement professional, procurement at, at that time did not have a lot of what you'd call full-time professionals. People would rotate through the department for a few years and then move on to something else to get what they would call commercial experience. And that would be you know, some experience dealing with contracts, dealing with suppliers and those types of things. And, and then they would move on to something else as opposed to there being a real solid base of, of procurement professionals and supply chain professionals. Um, there was a small cadre of them, yes, but as I said, there was a lot of rotation through the function. And um, so all of that was leading to a suboptimal uh, um, position for, you know, for managing the spend of the company. When you were talking about spend, you said that somewhat less than 50% of the spend was in manufacturing. Uh, what are some of the other categories of spend that were worth looking at? But that's a great question because, um, I mean, companies like Merck spend money on all sorts of things. It's not only things like laboratory supplies that you need for your research and development. Uh, it's things like management consulting services. It's things like car fleets for your huge sales forces. It's things like your laptop computers, which you need to give to both your sales forces and to your employees. It can be anything from um, the, the printing, uh, the printing um, materials that you're giving to your sales forces, handouts, uh, it can be um, the creative agencies that you, that you work with. 
to design multi-million dollar marketing campaigns and the media that you buy to run those campaigns. Um, so there were all sorts of spends uh, throughout the company in which uh, the Merck procurement people, they might be involved, but they certainly weren't driving the strategy for the category and how to best optimize that category and best optimize the supply base. And with that, um, there was a loss in opportunity because many of these suppliers had tremendous ideas on how to do it better. Uh, but they found that it was very difficult to work with Merck to change its own processes to adapt to those best-in-class type of ideas that they had to offer us. The procurement initiative represented a fundamental change for Merck. Were there any major bases on which you accomplished this initiative? It, I mean, it was basically a four-pronged approach. Um, it was, first of all, procurement process, there wasn't one standard process. So we had to look at a, a sourcing management process, basically, and teach people how to do that in a consistent manner and with a, um, a language and, uh, and with templates and with processes that were consistent on a global basis. So first, having a sourcing management process was really essential. Um, secondly, was just the people themselves. Many of the people uh, had grown up only in the Merck environment and had not seen how things were done on the outside. If you walked around Merck at that time, um, you asked people how long they'd been at Merck in 22 years, 23 years, 25 years, 30 years. Loyalty was very big at, at Merck and Merck was very loyal to its employees and there was a lot of longevity uh, for many employees. But this stifled the ability to bring in um, skills from the outside of what best practices were going on within other companies to help to, um, to make change. And so people and beefing up the skills of the current people plus bringing in some new blood to bring in some new ideas and different people who had done this before. Um, that was an essential part of it as well. Then there was supplier management. Um, there was no formal program for how you manage your suppliers. Uh, it was done in a very ad hoc manner and if a, a supplier management process was going on, it was normally for uh, operational type of metrics as opposed to driving real strategic value for the company. And so that was a, a, an area that, that really needed to be focused on. Then uh, the fourth area was just the whole concept of expense management itself. And that was how do you use less of what you're spending? How do you substitute? How do you abolish spend? How do you change process? How do you change policy? How do you do increased standardization of what you buy? Um, and how do you get compliance with what, with what you're trying to do? So all of those things fall under that concept of expense management. So those were sort of the four pillars under which we were, we were driving this change in the procurement function. But the change could not be relegated to just the procurement function. If this wasn't bought in by senior management and driven down by senior management and all the budget holders of the company who actually controlled the funds, then this would have been doomed to failure. So getting their alignment and promising them that they would see the benefit of what would be driven for them and with them in terms of sourcing their needs, that was a, that was a very key element to making this whole thing work.